So remembering that this is a story that's being told, um, penned by Dr. Luke, some of the stuff we're getting firsthand from his eyewitness account, and some of that stuff is clearly passed on from uh, reliable sources in his own words. So what you're getting really is an insight into the, the development of the church. And with it, it's some areas, it's very clear on what we might call its ecclesiology. It's understanding what the church is. And then you have some profound insights into its struggles, into some things it's not doing so well. It's not just an account of the church going from sort of zero to the heart of the Roman Empire in 30 to 40 years. It's also a church that is struggling. Welcome to the Thinking Church podcast with me, Chris Bright. Every week, I'll be speaking with a church leader about ministry strategy and getting to grips with not just what they do, but the thinking behind why they do it. So without further ado, let's get on with the show. My guest this week is Dr. John Andrews. Uh, John has been in full-time church leadership since 1987. Uh, though called to the UK, John has ministered in over 30 nations around the world uh, with a passion to equip and inspire leaders as well as empower followers of Jesus into effective lifestyle and service. John has pastored in churches in Havercroft, West Yorkshire, uh, in, in Rotherham, and has served on the team at Renewal Christian Centre in Solihull. John has also served as the principal of the British Assemblies of God Bible College and now travels extensively, engaging his passion to teach the word of God, inspiring a generation of Jesus followers to love and serve their world. And he's through online, he's been definitely doing that online through COVID as well. Uh, as a graduate of Mattersea Hall, he also holds a master's degree in Pentecostal and Charismatic Studies from Sheffield, Uni Sheffield University and a doctorate from the University of Wales. He's authored 12 books, including 252, Learning How to Grow on Purpose, and Extravagant, When Worship Becomes a Lifestyle. Uh, John, it's so great to have you back on the podcast. It's fantastic to be back. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great, great privilege and a great joy uh, to see you and to connect with you again. So thank you so much. Bless you. Brilliant. Well, um, well, let, let's dive into it because uh, I wanted to speak to you today because I've been blogging through the book of Acts and I, I think somehow I started it and it was one sunny morning. I was sat out on the decking and I thought, Do you know what, I'm going to blog through the book of Acts. And so far, I'm up to chapter four <laughs> and I'm eight blogs in. And this is going to take a long time to get to. So this might be become like a life's work or something. But what I've realized really quickly is that there is a lot of things that um, I need to have a little look through. And the reason that I mean, maybe it's probably worth before we crack into some questions and some topics is it was sort of unpack why I started doing it. And it, it was an idea, but it came from the fact that, you know, think your church is all to do with church strategy. And there's so many times I've heard over the years, I've been a Christian all my life. And hearing that we need to get back to how the early church did church, or we need to find the biblical way of doing church. And I was intrigued to find out, well, let's investigate that because I think we, a lot of people have said it, but, uh, and they have this mind that there's a kind of a, a manual of how to do church but is that is that the right way of looking at the book of acts is it a manual of how to run church oh that's a great question i i, I think i'm well done for digging into the book of acts because it is a great book um i i think it's certainly chris uh, a window into the beginnings and the development of the church i think you have to be careful how to read the book of acts so remembering that this is a story that's being told, um, penned by Dr. Luke, some of the stuff we're getting firsthand from his eyewitness account, and some of that stuff is clearly passed on from uh, reliable sources in his own words. So what you're getting really is an insight into the, the development of the church. And with it, it's some areas, it's very clear on what we might call its ecclesiology. It's understanding what the church is. And then you have some profound insights into its struggles, into some things it's not doing so well. It's not just an account of the church 
going from sort of zero to the heart of the Roman Empire in 30 to 40 years. It's also a church that is struggling with internal ideas, sometimes even with prejudice, sometimes with Bible issues and theology issues that it's grappling with. So as long as we understand when we're reading the book of Acts, what we're not reading is a well-polished ecclesiological manual. What you're getting is a story, raw, uh, vulnerable, honest, um, but not absolutely complete. It's clear that Dr. Luke is not covering every issue. It is clear he summarizes some big events. And it is also clear that there's a whole bunch of stuff he's leaving out because sort of by the middle of the book, he's really zeroing in on life with Paul and, and that particular expression of it. So as long as you understand that, that you're not looking at an A to Z of how to do church, but what you are getting are phenomenal insights that may teach us what is good and also warn us some of the pitfalls, then I think um, an approach to the book of Acts is absolutely essential for any Christian leader and, and anyone serious about seeking to establish church in the 21st century. Yeah, and I wonder that it's, that it's wonder if we can sort of dive into some of the uh, some sort of the sort of overarching strategy of, of of Acts. Is there can you is there a way to be able to plot the can we plot the the strategy of what the church is doing? Is there a strategy in place, or you know, are they just kind of figuring it out as they go, or can you sense that there is some you know there's some thinking behind this, or you know, um, even if you want to say you know it's leading by the Holy Spirit, but there you know there's still a there's still some kind of uh, plan that's being being worked out. Yeah, I, I think it's a bit of both. I think when you are looking at the early chapters of Acts, there is a sense in which uh, this thing's just accelerating. It's exploding. Um, you know, you're, we're, we're getting numbers in the thousands who are in some way or another responding. And I think by Acts chapter six, for example, We've reached a place where you've got some serious organizational thinking going on. Uh, so Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves and you get a sense of what the community starts to look like. Some of the big ideas that they're starting to build on and structure. But you're still getting a lot of fluidity between the Jewishness of this new group, the way, and, uh, you know, this, this sense that it's, it's supposed to be open to the Gentile world, which it's starting to struggle with. There's this interplay between houses and the temple. Uh, they don't seem to have buildings in the way that we see them and understand them today. So there's a huge fluidity there. And then, of course, uh, by chapter six, you've got such growth within the church that you've got massive internal strife around, can I say carefully, uh, racial issues within uh, a sort of a Jewish Christian developing worldview. So you've got clashes between Hebraic widows and Hellenistic widows uh, simply because of the distribution of food, which points to this, the sheer scale this thing is growing at. Uh, and then, of course, we get this sort of explosion with Stephen in uh, chapters 6, 7, and 8. We, we get this uh, introduction to this incredible young man who actually helps distribute the food more accurately and, and professionally. But then he also gets engaged in an incredible sermon, which becomes the touch point, becomes the catalyst, the tipping point for a persecution that breaks out in the church and essentially scatters a largely Jewish contingent of the way into the rest of the world. And that's where it starts to collide with the Gentiles. So if we're looking for strategy early on, it's hard to really get your teeth into that. I think what you've got is a very, very dynamic Jerusalem Christian community. I think you've got a very strong Judean Christian community. I think you've got a real reluctance to reach out beyond the borders of Judea. There's no strategic evidence that the church was doing that. And it's not until persecution happens that that starts to happen. And then it's when we get into Paul uh, or Saul, if you like, and Barnabas, we start to get a sense of strategic thinking around what is going on. And we really start to lean into an idea of planting Christian communities everywhere where there aren't any, uh, if possible, out of Jewish communities. But if that's not possible, straight into Gentile communities. 
And we also get a real commitment to discipleship, to training, to development and equipping. So, so they really start to develop into this sort of uh, sense of strategy as you hit sort of the middle of the book, you're getting a sense of the church seems to really know what it's doing in terms of reaching the regions beyond, planting Christian communities and training and equipping followers of the way. And I think that's a developmental idea, a bit messy at the beginning. It feels like that anyway. It may have been not so messy, but it feels like that at the beginning and much more, it feels much more strategic towards the end, which is maybe pointing to the idea that part of this, they were sort of learning as they went along and other things they were much more comfortable with. So again, uh, it helps us to read the book of Acts as a developing narrative. Yeah, I'd like to dive into the the, 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 the classic 242 passage, which is, mm. I think it's the most classic scripture you know when when everyone says you know let's get back to the book of acts and that kind of thing and i hear it a lot i do hear it, i've heard it a lot um and that what they're referring to is is this passage here now i've sort of researching this i was looking into this and i was reading about first century synagogues and i found a bit of a correlation between that and Acts 2.42, there seemed like there's some kind of, you know, there, there's developments for sure from, from uh, the synagogue. But um, am I missing something here? Or is what's going on in this passage in Acts 2.42? Is, is there something, is there something brand new? Or is there something that's kind of lived out of, of their, their current understanding? Uh, well, I, again, I think it's a bit of both. I think uh, verse 41 really helps us in Acts chapter 2, because it tells us that there's another big influx numerically into this new community, into this sect, as it's being referred to, or followers of the way. And then what you're having to get as a result of that is a sense of we need to start organizing. Now, imagine, you know, I mean, we, we've all experienced this. Suddenly you're thrust into something. You have to start organizing what you tend to do is default to ideas you already know. So is there anything in the Jewish world that would help them organize communities of believers better? Oh, I know. Yeah, synagogue. There we are. So, so actually, it's not a surprise that what you're getting, especially in the early Jewish communities or largely Jewish communities that become followers of the way, it's really not surprising that you're leaning into some really well-worn ideas that they already know. They know how to do community. They know how to share. They know how to disciple. They know how to build confessional lit uh, uh, liturgy. They know how to really instill ideas into communities. In fact, the synagogue system really grew out of exile and this idea that they couldn't go to the temple, they couldn't even go to their own land. And the synagogues really developed as many communities, many temples that would help both preserve the Torah and uh, develop a sense of community around the word of God and around their identity in God. So, so what you're getting, I think, is a, is a little bit of a mix of all of that. And, and in fact, if you also widen it out a bit, you'll see early Christians, early followers of Jesus also still going to the temple. They're still using the sort of patterns of temple prayer, for example, to follow their own prayers. And we, we have that in Acts 3, where the man is healed at the gate beautiful at the hour of prayer. So, so you, you get a sense that what's happening is they're clearly bringing some new stuff in here. And, and the apostles teaching of Acts 2.42 leans into that, where clearly they are rooting their, their theology and their ecclesiology much more on Jesus' interpretation of the Torah or Jesus' fulfillment of the Torah than they are on Moses per se. And that's a new development. But things like prayers, Things like fellowship in the in the truest sense, uh, the idea of um, uh, you know supporting one another through th these are well worn ideas within a Jewish community, and therefore would be naturally developed. And, and what's really interesting is in Acts two forty two, if you go all the way down to verse first forty seven, you're getting a mix of what feels like structural approach. So there's things that they're common on; they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching the breaking of bread, which could refer to both sort of the last supper and just meals together, um, prayers and, and fellowship. And then you get this commentary on it that they 
if anyone had need, they help one another, they supported each other, they shared in each other. That's a very, very Hebraic idea. And the idea that your faith could somehow ignore the community needs of your brothers and sisters is an alien concept to, um, to Torah and an alien concept to, to good Jewish believers. So there's a natural lead into this. And so when we read 242 onwards, we I think there's some patterns we could follow. I think apostles teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. I mean, I think they travel anywhere. And then I think you're also getting expressions of real uh, Judaistic culture or Jewish culture that is now traveling to a new uh, uh, trajectory under the guidance of the teaching of Jesus in the way. And therefore, new things are developing as well as um, perhaps leaning into older ideas. Yeah, it, it certainly seems, when I was writing a blog on it, it definitely seemed to me that I, I described them as supercharged synagogues, you know, and I think what you're, it's hitting on that the fact that synagogues were built around the teaching of Moses, but this is around the teaching of, of Jesus, and the teaching of Jesus is, you've heard it said, but now I say to you, and it's, it's going that one level further, so it's not, it's not just, well, it's not just we'll be charitable. It's like we will sell stuff if we need to. We're going that. It's, everything to me seems to be that kind of one step further. And, uh, you know, when I was looking into first century synagogues, it was, yes, they, they looked into, um, I've got some things here, they, they would um, have political meetings and they would have uh, worship there and they would have, uh, they would, you know, give to the poor. But it just always seems like there's, they're going that one, there's that one step further where they're taking it back and they're not just taking it to the teachings of Moses, but the teaching, teachings of Jesus. So it's, it's almost taking what, what's the community that you know and how can, how does the teachings of Jesus change what we know? And that's what I, so I was trying to think about. How do you put that into today? Because, you know, we have aspects of community that we know, you know, even from, you know, established churches or community centers or, you know, go to watch football matches. There's, there's essences of community. And is that something, is there something that we can learn from that? But maybe it's not quite the kind of, what I was grew, grew up with, what people saying, you know, the kind of hippie commune <laughs> style thing that, that kind of people said, oh, you know, you've got to sell all your property. I don't think that's what they're getting at. It seems like there's something a little bit, a little bit more attainable. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I think what you've got in, for example, by the time we hit Acts chapter four uh, and, and a little bit further is you've got a sense that the parameters, the beliefs, the ideas of this new community of the way is really starting to gather traction. But remember, they're looking for models that, that actually are going to help carry this, this new community. And there are some well-worn ideas within their world in terms of how to do that community uh, and how to help one another and support one another. And remember, uh, you used the word supercharged there. I remember, of course, the other massive element that's going on here is this empowerment of this community by the person of the Holy Spirit. So you've, you've now got two incredible elements that are really at the heart of this change. You've got um, a, a, an understanding that Jesus is, is not only a way to read Moses, but Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses. That's a radical idea. And in fact, ultimately, that would become a bit of a clash in the largely Jewish church because some would say, well, no, to become a Christian, you've got to go through Moses to come to Christ. Paul starts to argue, no, no, you can come straight to Jesus. You don't have to go through Moses. So, so this is a radical idea. They're not, just, they're not just reading Moses differently. Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses. He is the fulfillment of the Tanakh, the whole of the scriptures. And then secondly, they are empowered by the Spirit. So, so imagine then that, that new sense of, if you like, theology alongside this empowerment by the Holy Spirit, this pneumatology, then this pushes something into this community, which is very different. So these great ideas, which many of which are rooted in Torah, now, as you say, become sort of supercharged or they become a, a different focus and push out. And of course, it does teach us that, that engagement with the kingdom of God does two amazing things as far as our culture is concerned. One is it challenges our culture. So there's some things about my culture which need to change. And actually, I can't just put a Christian jacket on it and sort of sex it up a little bit and sort of think, oh, okay, I've got Jesus. So it's okay to have that part of my culture as long as Jesus is sort of in the mix. 
There are some things in my culture, my upbringing, even my religious background and culture that are challenged by the kingdom of God. And we have to accept that. And I think you start to see that in the book of Acts. You start to see wonderful Jewish believers really getting uncomfortable with the idea of Gentiles coming into the church without going through Moses. So that's one example of challenge of culture. But then the other thing that the Bible or the kingdom of God does brilliantly is that it can also absorb and transform our culture. So in other words, there could be things within our culture that uh, the kingdom doesn't just challenge in a sense and say we have to change or eradicate, but actually the kingdom can jump onto and bring a sense of life and health within that. So, so for example, today we're having all phenomenal conversations about, about what does online community look like? What does what does, can we do online church, for example? Now, that conversation wasn't relevant 50 years ago because culturally, technologically, it's just not, not possible. Now we're having theological conversations partly because of the cultural developments in our world. And so we're asking questions, okay, where does the theology of the kingdom and the theology of the church fit with, for example, technology? Can the two marry together? Or is it a case of challenge? Or is it a case of adaptation and change? And I think that's a great example. So, so it's, it's, it's recognizing that the, the values of the kingdom challenge our culture. And sometimes we have to change in order for the kingdom to come. Um, and then sometimes they sort of help adapt our culture, make the best of our culture, uh, use uh, the elements of our culture for the glory of God, provide it, provide it. And this is a big proviso provided it doesn't mean fundamentally compromising the values and ethics of that kingdom. So if I'm imbibing my culture and I'm having to compromise my belief system in order to imbibe that culture, then that, that's a no-no. But if there are elements of my culture that can be redeemed by the kingdom of God, by following Jesus in the way, then why not? We should use all of that in order to present uh, Jesus to our world. Yeah, I was, um, so I was, I was working through this morning on the beginning of uh, Acts chapter four. And what really struck me at the beginning of that chapter was just um, how offensive the gospel was. And I sometimes, I was starting to think about it, thinking about how sometimes, I'm not suggesting that we should become horrible people, but that, that um, when you live out the, the gospel, there, there, it can be offensive. And, that, and, we, and maybe we, that's something that we've lost maybe in the Western society is that that ability for the gospel to be uh, offensive now yeah don't hear what i'm not saying i'm not suggesting you know no. placards and, and anything like that yeah. um no. uh, or you know shouting yeah. I, people I, but there is something no, about no, the, I, the idea of it it could be it should be a bit more it should create a strong reaction exactly i i think there's a difference between being obnoxious and offensive in the way we do things and people being offended or challenged or uncomfortable with what we actually believe. So if people are being put off my faith because I'm, you know, a Muppet, because I'm behaving appallingly, because uh, my behavior is at, at every level unacceptable, then that's nothing to do with the gospel. That's to do with me not getting my brain in gear and not actually taking control of my personality and character. Um, and over the years, I have seen really bad behavior, really bad behavior on behalf of Christ, excused on the basis of, well, the gospel offends people. Absolutely. It does offend people when we get really down to it. And you can see that in the life of Jesus uh, uh, over and over again. You know, I was reading in Luke 13, Jesus heals the woman on the Sabbath. And it says that the, the experts in the law, that those who led the synagogue were humiliated by his words, but all the people were delighted by his actions so there's jesus in the synagogue literally splitting the crowd um but he's he's not going out of his way to be obnoxious anybody can be obnoxious uh, and we've had some controversy this week uh even in terms of our political arena where senior politicians describing other politicians with words that if i'd have used that in front of my mother my mother would have probably put me on over her knee so so it's this is unacceptable if people are going to be offended at your ideas hey, look, there's very little we can do about that. But if people are offended because we're just being stupid, because we're not behaving well, then, then that, that's something we've got to change. 
Jesus did come to bring a, a, a sword, and the sword was the sword of truth that would divide people, but he didn't come to destroy people, he didn't come to humiliate people, and he didn't come to unnecessarily polarize people. Society is polarized enough without our behavior making it easier to hate Jesus or easier to reject the church. So I would appeal to Christians, I would appeal to leaders, listen, be passionate, be clear. Let's be men and women who are able to stand up and defend uh, the ideas of, of Bible and gospel and Jesus as Jesus followers. But that's do it in a way that actually is not uh, hurting the very message so that people are not turning away from it because of us but they're turning away from it if they do that because of it. And then that that's there's nothing we can do about that. That's the way it is, and that's the way it will always be. But, uh, but when we properly present the gospel, when we really get down to Jesus, and it is Jesus. I In my 34 years of ministry experience, when we talk about God generically, talk about creation generically, talk about nice spiritual ideas generically, it's amazing who you can be friends with in the room introduce Jesus into the conversation, and he has a, an amazing ability to split a room. And it's often that some of the greatest offense is around the claims of Christ, both to us and for us and on us. So, so I, I think we've got to stay focused on that and remember that's, that, that's got to happen, but we don't, we don't need to be offensive per se in order for that to happen. Yeah, no, I think that's really helpful. Um, and getting that distinguish that like that distinguishment right, I think that's gonna be really helpful because I think sometimes I worry that um 20th, 21st century church probably is a little bit too nice sometimes in its ideas. You know, we can sure. talk about things that don't that, that that um you know we're very nice in our presentation, which I think is brilliant and we should remain that way, but sometimes we we need to allow the gospel to bring that kind of strong reaction and i think that's going to be a helpful thing for the church to 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 embrace and i think that's what people interestingly are, are, are looking for they're looking for you know narratives that are gonna they can orient their lives around and when we don't come with that strong narrative of what the gospel actually talks about um and i i think it, it doesn't give people that opportunity to pick up that narrative but i think when we do it is going to create a strong reaction one way or the other and and, and maybe that's something that we're going to have to be um, more and more increasingly as we go into a kind of you know post-christian society that's something we might have to be more aware of and aware of that actually that you know some of what we believe might be offensive to other people and that's okay we, and it was offensive to the early church it, it definitely seems seems that way um yeah uh, for sure and and i would say uh, you know it, it's not just the ideas of christianity there'll be lots of ideas out there that i don't necessarily agree with it's the way we then present those ideas and the way we engage those ideas i think one of the things uh without taking us in a direction we probably don't want to go today but one of the things i really worry about for this country is a sort of um, subculture or sub idea that seems becoming mainstream where actually certain ideas, certain thoughts, certain beliefs, certain opinions are, are even, you know, being questioned and the, the, the freedom to think, the freedom to express and the freedom to disagree or the freedom to present your ideas. I mean, they are at the bedrock of our society. I think they're at the bedrock of all good biblical thinking. And I get really worried when we're sort of being told what we can and cannot think or what we can and cannot agree with. And if we are going to agree or disagree with it, how we can agree or disagree with that, I, 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 that's what worries me. And I think the next five to 10 years in terms of how we do public conversation on very difficult and potentially divisive conversations, which include faith and followership of Jesus and our views on other things because of that, I think that's going to be absolutely um, fascinating and maybe defining for the next 50 years, how we do the next five to 10 years. And certainly I, I'm an avid social media person uh, and, and some of the behavior on social media really does start to worry me in terms of attitude uh, to difference of opinion, how those opinions are expressed and how we appropriate ourselves to differences of opinion. And I think the gospel is right in the middle of that. And if we're going to proclaim Jesus clearly, I think we're always going to uh, find ourselves uh, one way or another at the wrong end of some conversations. 
uh, without without that worrying us or making us paranoid. But it's how society responds to that is going to be really, really crucial, uh, both at a social and maybe even a legal level in the days to come. So fascinating stuff, really. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Uh, let's move on. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, get into some more sort of uh, structural strategy that's in Acts. Um, firstly, in chapter six uh, is the classic uh, passage where the apostles choose the the seven, and the the, the reason for that, I think. I, I was I've been reading ahead essentially so in my thinking I know that you know whilst it's taking me about you know uh it's probably gonna take me about two years to go through the, the book of Acts by blog by blog um I'm you know reading ahead I'm, I'm intrigued to sort of find out these little little bits and and when we get to to this the reasons that the apostles give us to freeing them up, them up was to focus on prayer and the ministry of the world uh, and ministry of the word uh do you think that job description has started to change in terms of what we expect of a church leader in the modern age. And do we need to think about correcting it? Is that, is that, a, is that, a, is that the kind of where the, the job description of the pastor or the church leader, should I, should I say maybe more accurately, is that, is that a good place to start with? Um, I think it's a great conversation starter. I think it's trying to really lean into what's going on at X6. And I think you've got, um, strong spiritual leaders, many of whom will have been with Jesus, struggling to organize and uh, look after practically a, a growing and diverse uh, community of followers of the way. Um, and even though they are full of the Holy Spirit, and even though they carry tremendous gifts of ministry, they're clearly struggling on uh, how do how do we distribute these sandwiches and make sure you know everybody gets gets proper stuff. Now, what what it shows us, of course, is that a growing community needs diversity of gift. It needs a uh, strong administrative understanding, uh, and it needs a sense of good organizational competency around it. Now, if if sort of the Apostle Peter can do all of that. That's amazing. But it's quite clear from Acts 6, they are struggling to do all of that. And in fact, the, the nuance seems to be that the more they're trying to do the sort of day-to-day -day organizational type stuff, the more they're getting pulled away from maybe the diamond head spirituality stuff where uh, the word of God and prayer, which will bring spiritual direction and distinction to this, uh, what is after all spiritual community. So I think there's a real tussle there, and it's really worth leaders leaning into what is going on there and what are they asking. These guys are not just asking, oh, look, we don't want to serve sandwiches. Let somebody else serve the sandwiches. You know, somebody else. They're not just trying to palm off a job. They're really struggling to organize a burgeoning community. And so they realize we need to get to grips with this and we need to do it right now. And they do it in a very, very clever way where they uh, uh, see people raised up who've got some passion, gifting, and ability, as well as being full of the Holy Spirit. Really interesting. They all had to be full of the Holy Spirit, uh, and these people are charged with that. Uh, I, I think one of the great challenges for modern church leaders is that with the professionalization of ministry, by and large, and also with the rigors of modern church, you know, churches today are, most churches, certainly in the United Kingdom, let's talk about our context, most churches are small businesses, some of them not so small, and they have to be run on, on good financial lines, good charitable lines if they are charities. They've got to be run uh, in ways that both are acceptable theologically and biblically and also uh, compatible with societal requirements. So you've got a whole raft of challenges now given to leaders that just weren't apparent 100 years ago, 500 years ago, or even 2000 years ago. And so leaders are having to do more and more stuff. They're, they're having to be sort of almost a jack of all trades. And the challenge with that is that our, our expectancy for our leaders to do all of that means that they are being more and more pulled away, uh, potentially, from prayer, the word, and from things that we would perceive as openly, profoundly spiritual. Now, there's a sense in which you know, for me, admin is spiritual and organization is spiritual. But you know what I mean by that? If, if I'm spending all day on a spreadsheet and not getting to the word of God, 
I'm not getting to prayer. I'm not getting to hear the heart of God for my community. And that's actually what I'm supposed to be doing. Then that is a challenge. So I do think that church leaders face real challenges today in terms of prioritization. I think there's real challenges within the church in terms of education. I think many people within our churches sort of just expect our leaders, whatever they call them, pastors or vicars or whatever, to do all of this stuff, to do everything. And actually what, what uh, both Old and New Testament seem to try and show us is, is when we engage community, when we raise up believers, when we raise up a gene pool of gifts and talents, then actually uh, it allows people to specialize in the areas that they should, while also ensuring the everyday sort of stuff gets covered. And for me, that's worth revisiting. I, 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 I am... I, I would be worried about leaders under pressure who are not getting time to just be in the word of God, not getting time to pray, not getting time to really dig and get a sense of clarity on belief and practice for that community. And I think it's really important that we try to protect that. So I think right early on, you're getting that tension introduced. The thing's only really getting going and we're already getting a pull that actually I could be out all day doing stuff but maybe neglecting the stuff I really should be doing and finding the, the balance in that or managing the tension in that, I think is an absolute crucial idea for, for, for leaders going forward and one that we must grapple with. Yeah, it, um, I, I was discussing uh, with Chaz and Anne Paul, this is on the, the previous podcast and that's coming out um, the week before this one comes out. And, uh, and they were talking about and actually encouraging me after we finished recording and um chaz said to me i, I didn't say this but I, I would almost advocate that pastors and church leaders need to actually be putting in time in their day just to spend time in the presence of god because it's and, and and just i think it's one of those things where we're in danger of forgetting i think in and in, in this in this day and age because i think we're we're into the you know get things done work 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 you know even preaching is, is often as much a technical skill of, 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 of message prep as it is, you know, hearing the voice of God and, and taking that time because, you know, sometimes there's no, there's no guaranteed outcomes with spending time in the presence of God. You might spend the presence, time in the presence of God and he tells you something about yourself or you just worship or, or whatever that is. Um, and, but it's so easy to jump to those, got to get things done, got to do the doing. And I just, I, I think they're, they're struck that they, you know, of the two things they could have said, it was, it was those two things, but also how, you know, when you think about prayer, you know, great prayer, you start to hear the voice of God, that's going to lead to great strategy. That's going to lead to the effective ministry of the word. So they, the two things work together really, really well. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's remembering Chris, you know, we, we are spiritual first and leaders second. So we're not just leaders. We're not just, you know, managers of the local, you know, commodity store or, you know, the local supermarket. We are spiritual leaders. Uh, and, and, you know, whether people like the term leader or prefer shepherd or, or whatever language you use, but we are spiritual first. So if we are spiritual leaders of a fundamentally spiritual community, that yes, absolutely has practical applications and challenges and requirements. Absolutely, we, we get all of that. But if we're spiritual leaders first, then we must be leaning into that. And I would actually argue, and I, I love your reflection there. I, I would actually argue this, that one of the mistakes that modern leaders make is that they do not see prayer and reading of the scriptures or meditating on the scriptures or studying the scriptures as part of their work they often see that oh that's something i do before i come to work yeah so when i come to work at, at the church office or when i go out to visit people um then i have to make sure i've got my bible and i'm um, a prayer done before i go out to work um and what we've done is we've taken a sort of a mentality that would that would sort of absolutely work if i work for marks and spencers you know i have to be at the office of marks and spencers for nine right then there's a whole bunch of stuff i want to try and get done in my spirituality perhaps before i go and work then an eight-hour shift for marks and spencers because i can't do word and prayer in that sense in marks and spencers but in spiritual leadership we should be advocating that prayer and word and openness to the holy spirit 
and worship. They are part of our work. If, if we taught a mentality that they are part of our work, then perhaps we would build it. We would have the confidence and the security to build these ideas into our day, not just squeeze them in at the end of the day or feel the only place for them is the beginning of a day. And, and I, I, I think there has to be, I think professionalism has driven uh, spiritual leadership into that sort of arena. And, and you know me, you, you know, I, I love dotting my eyes and I love uh, crossing my T's and I, I love my work and I love doing what, I, and I have no problem pulling uh, a, a shift. So I love it all. But, but we're not simply managers. We are not simply leaders. We are not simply organizers. We are spiritual shepherds, leaders of, of a supernatural community. And therefore we must be giving time on a day-by-day -day basis to those issues. And I think X6 is a real red flashing light for the early church, which, which they at least have the courage, not only to address, but Dr. Luke has the courage to show us, hey, something was starting to go slightly wrong here. And we're just showing you X6 is a really wobbly chapter. And actually they, they got to it, they fixed it, and they addressed it, and they put the main thing as the main thing without neglecting widows in the process. No, oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, I'd love to talk about some org, all sort of org chart style things now. And I think sometimes we want to see if there's, you know, is there an, a natural org chart that's in the Book of Acts? And uh, there, are, there are some denominations that would would argue that uh, one there was one central leader in the church, Peter. Um, some don't do that. I mean, the book doesn't seem to tell that story. Um, what's the organizational structure that we can pick up with in the in the early church? I guess overall, but there's are there things we can pick up church to church as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's actually quite loose, so it's really really hard, <clears throat> as far as I can see, to <clears throat> find a definitive structure in the Book of Acts. <clears throat> Part of this may be because it is developing. Some of it may be because Dr. Luke isn't really thinking this is as important for us uh, as we're going forward. So it could be a number of reasons, but you do get some really fascinating insights. Um, you, it, there are three major churches mentioned in the book of Acts in a, in a detailed way. We get some measure of detail. You've got Jerusalem, you've got Antioch, and you've got Ephesus. In Jerusalem, the leadership structure, let me use that term, the leadership structure seems to be apostles and elders, which is fascinating. Um, and of course, it's really interesting. Peter, people tend to think about Peter rocking around there, but actually the emergent voice, funnily enough, is Jesus's half-brother, James. James is the one who sort of seems to step up, especially in one of the most uh, important church council meetings in the early church in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 15. James is the one who sort of uh, brings leadership there. Now that could have been because Peter uh, felt somewhat uh, compromised by some things. He, he's, he's got the Cornelius thing going on and then him and Paul clearly had a bit of a to-do as well uh, over the Gentile issue. So Peter may have felt a little bit uncertain on this, but James shows real leadership. He steps up. And he seems to represent the voice of the Jerusalem church or churches uh, within that context. And then you move into Antioch and you've got prophets and teachers leading the church uh, within that. Actually, interesting, Antioch is a phenomenal example of the first genuinely multicultural leadership team in the Bible, in the book of Acts. So you've got true multiculturalism happening there. It's worth a dig, worth a little look into that, um, maybe a subject for another time. And then you've got Ephesus. Ephesus becomes one of the foremost churches in that region, an outstanding church. We know that Timothy eventually goes there, and it even gets references in the book of Revelation. It was an outstanding church, and that is led by plurality of elders, and in fact, if you read the book of Acts, the pattern seems to be less super leader and more plurality of leaders. Now, that's not to say that one leader couldn't emerge to lead or there is a sort of a, a, a recognition that there's a James or, or there's a Barnabas or there's a Timothy. I mean, all of those things may well exist. And practically, there's good, there's good uh, thinking around that. But actually, the dominant emerging pattern 
in the early church as far as running local churches is concerned seems to be plurality of elders and that's a striking idea uh, i i grew up in assemblies of god and you know when i was a boy every assemblies of god leader was a pastor so it was pastor this or pastor that and ironically in the new testament there's not a single example of a pastor leading a church you know being the lead gift in that church it's really quite striking um so so what you tend to get are groups of leaders relating perhaps to what we call Ephesians 411 ministries so they relate to apostles they relate to pa prophets pastors evangelists and teachers they may even be resident in their communities or they may be translocal in order to help them and you get that sense for example in Corinth Paul is translocal for Corinth helping them apostolically while they clearly have a local leadership group team leading that church as with Ephesus as with Philippi as with many of these other churches one of the things it is worth leaning into is that in the book of Acts uh, at least as far as Antioch and Jerusalem is concerned Antioch seems to give deference to Jerusalem so Antioch seems to see that Jerusalem has this sort of big authority power base to make big decisions and 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 they want to be uh, completely in line with that um in that so so there is a sense of that but the further you get into the book of acts uh the less the influence of uh the jerusalem uh church is having and that's simply because of a natural trajectory you've got now the christian community moving further and further and further into gentile territory and it's quite natural then that the influence of jerusalem is just waning simply because of the geography and maybe because of um the confidence and the maturity of the christian community in a sort of a non jewish led context so i think there's development there but what you certainly don't have is a sort of a super leader forgive my language for any roman catholic listeners you, you certainly don't have a pope idea you, you you don't have a senior leader i mean these are language that we're all comfortable with today none of it's biblical none of it's biblical so we throw words like senior leader around and i'm comfortable with that i serve under a senior leader but actually it's not a biblical uh even phraseology or idea but i'm comfortable with leaders emerging in plurality and the big idea is plurality of leadership in the in the hierarchy of local church yeah i mean i've been thinking quite a lot about um plurality of leadership i was talking to some some friends of mine just recently and they were, they were talking about you know a, a sort of a flat top leadership uh and they've been sort of exploring that and um not within their church but just sort of in terms of study and um and i think it's fascinating i think there's there's it's definitely not an it's definitely not an easy choice i think that's that's no. for sure because with it no. you know i've i've seen it done well i've seen it done poorly where it can almost people don't know whether they're coming or going no no decisions get made uh you end up everything slows down so i think we've still it doesn't it it fixes some problems and causes some other ones in in some senses How, sure. it, is there a, a way that we can start to get around that because what we want to do is we, we don't i think what a senior leader does well is obviously it can it, it has that that primary decision making point but the problem is then you often have that single point of failure issue which I think is a big problem for the church. Really, really big Absolutely. problem. Um, no, so it's exactly right. And I, I, I think whatever model of leadership you're going to go for, so if you're, if you're wanting to lean in to say, well, let's try and, let's try and follow the pattern of plurality of, of elders, for example, to use that biblical language, if not necessarily modern language, um, then, then you're still grappling with, okay, how do we ultimately formulate uh, the decisions so is it consensual uh, do we even go to things like a vote or 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 do we actually look to someone within the team to to lead us on this issue and I think all of that it's it can be all of the above I mean I think that's the beauty of it we the the, the New Testament is not definitive on how to run a local church that's part of the glory and frustration of the New Testament it's there's not like we can go to a book in the New Testament and go okay here's how to here's how to run a church council here's how to run an eldership group here's here's how apostles relate to elders what what you've got are insights and then what you've got are some principles to guide us i i think the senior leader model uh also has uh strengths and vulnerabilities but i think the best senior leader models for example and i have 
served with on and uh, and being part of those. Uh, the best senior leader models is where a senior leader really builds strong uh, team of of people who should be in the room, people who can contribute, people who've got gifts worthy of the position, and also people who can challenge uh, um, sort of uh, and and are allowed to say no on given issues uh, because that keeps the senior leaders safe. Any senior leader that's surrounded by people who can't say no to them or, or who won't listen to the no being said is really setting themselves up for, for some trouble in the long run. And you see that in the Old Testament. You see brilliant examples of outstanding autocratic leaders who were brilliant kings. And when they were brilliant, then the people prospered. The problem was the same autocratic system, if you get a terrible leader, then the people suffer because there's no checks and balances within the system. So, so the idea of um, actually creating plurality of leadership, however you express that in terms of um, senior leaders or apostles or prophets, if there's a plurality within that, I think though there are challenges within it, I think it is, it is an easier model to work with and work from. Uh, all right, we've got enough time for, for, for one more uh, question. Yeah. I'd love to pick up on the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. I think this is really mm. interesting uh, because this is someone who becomes a disciple of Jesus and then they go back to their own country and there's no indication there's other believers there. I, I looked in Acts chapter two and they weren't, Ethiopia wasn't one of the places listed. And no. so it makes me think about online because I know, look, I know this wasn't written with online in mind at all, but it's the, the, there's a transference of, transference of concept here where, you know, how can someone be discipled from far away? How did that Ethiopian um, have, you know, he would have probably had to travel all the way back to Jerusalem likelihoods. You know, he might be having had a quite a traveling job. We don't know. Um, is there anything in this passage that we can can take through and especially if we're thinking about online church and discipling people from a distance maybe i, I mean it's a fascinating story and there's a little echo in this story in the gospels you know where where jesus uh delivers the man that we know as legion it's not his name but that's what the, the demons call themselves sort of thing we are legion um and and jesus sets him free and then the man says to Jesus, as Jesus is getting in the boat in, uh, in Mark chapter five, can I come with you? And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Go home and tell your family and tell all your friends what the Lord has done for you and how he's been merciful to you. And you go, what? Uh, and so Jesus is sending this guy off. No discipleship, no community. Remember in Mark five, he's in the Decapolis. So that's the 10 cities, the sort of Gentile region. Uh, so, so it's not like you could find a local synagogue or anything going on there. This is, this is just raw. Um, and then fast forward to the end of uh, sort of Mark chapter six, and you've got, uh, and at the end of Mark five, you've got people begging Jesus to leave. And at the end of Mark chapter six, in the same region, when they heard Jesus had arrived, it says they recognized him, they ran to him and begged him to touch them. So uh, when he leaves in Mark chapter five, there are one convert and they're begging him to leave. When he returns at the end of Mark chapter six, they're begging him to heal them. So something has changed and I suspect it's him. It's this bloke, this nameless bloke. I think there's something similar going on to the Ethiopian here. I think he is absolutely, at least on the record, he's our first African convert. Uh, and we know that a strong Ethiopian church emerges. It's one of the oldest churches in Christendom. And, and who knows, it probably emerged out of this man returning. And somehow um, he goes back with the scroll of Isaiah, having been taught by Philip to look for Jesus in the scroll of Isaiah, and as far as we know, that's all he's got. He might have more if he was wealthy enough. And he goes back and a, a community emerges out of that that become followers of Jesus. So I, I think there's a couple of things to reflect on, Chris. I think number one, it's supreme confidence in the word of God. So the word and actions of Jesus on the man in, in the Decapolis uh, was enough to get him moving and to, to make him a proclaimer of the way. 
of, the, of being a follower of Jesus. And it seems to be the same with the Ethiopian, uh, armed with only what we would call uh, the book of Isaiah and the scripture, Isaiah 53, which is the particular passage that Philip expounds, the Ethiopian goes back and on the basis of that word and that transform uh, tra transformative experience. Uh, something begins. So I think we've got to have confidence in the word. And I think it's recognizing that ultimately, whatever it looks like, we've got to try and attach people to some form of ongoing community. Now, if online can provide that community connection for a continued sense of conversation, and also really important for me, expression. So, so for me, Christian community is not just about a commonality of confession, but it is an opportunity for expression and engagement. That's really the big idea. So, so one of my challenges in thinking through online church is, is remembering some of the big motifs of church in the New Testament are marriage and family. And I, I would ask myself, right, could I do my marriage online? Could I run, raise my family online? Uh, it is theoretically possible, but we'd have to really work incredibly hard with that. Um, so could online be part of that conversation? Absolutely. If online was the only element of that conversation, would it leave me a bit short or not? And I think, I think what's really exciting today is that we're having a theology about our technology. We're having a conversation about, okay, this is really exciting. The online stuff is really amazing. The lockdown has catalyzed this conversation for many British churches. Some, some uh, other churches around the world are well ahead of us on this, but it's really nudged us. But we've, we've got to think about, right, what does online community mean how could it be used to disciple people and is it an end in itself or does it have to be part of something else does it need to move people towards perhaps some sense of not only physical community but but uh as it were a uh, community contribution and world country because because being a follower of the way is both in Word looking and outward looking. It's it's personal, but it's community. It's me having a personal relationship with the Lord, but that relationship emerging into some form of community. And then, and I would argue, and this is a big one, into some form of cause that actually we're pushing our faith towards a cause to reach the world for Jesus. So so I, I, I'm excited about the conversations. I think there are some challenges around, not the practicalities, the practicalities I think we can work through. I think we really need to have the courage to grapple with the theology of it and recognize there's some stuff really lends itself to us online. Very easy. We can use other stuff. Okay, okay do we need to think a bit deeper about that? And um, what would that look like if, if we run certain scenarios out? And I think if the church has the courage to do that. We return to the sort of conversation we had right at the beginning of our convo, which is a conversation around the kingdom of God challenging culture and making, if you like, redeeming culture, making the best of it. I think that the church can both challenge online ideas and also redeem the best of those ideas. And if we're prepared to grapple with that and not just go, go light and cheap and easy and quick, if we're prepared to grapple with these conversations, I think we can get the best of multiple worlds and multiple platforms that help us disciple followers of Jesus in the 21st century. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. John, for, for joining us. And it's probably worth me just saying at the end uh, that you have a podcast, which is the, the Two Texts podcast. Yes. And, uh, uh, and I, I should have put it at the start and I completely forgot to add it in, but just I'll encourage everyone just to check that out. It's a great podcast and uh, it's well worth a, a listen. And uh, thank you. Um, so, but yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today, uh, Dr. John. I'm sure I'll probably be asking you again for more questions on another area of theology and church life and just really appreciate all your input to, to Thinking Church. Absolutely. And listen, if, if you're if you're blogging on X and you want to continue the conversation on X and dig into some more, we could have a part two or a part three, because I could talk all day about this stuff. So uh, so it wouldn't be a problem at all. Bless you. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Oh, bless you, man. See you soon. Bye bye.